just going to pass around the uh, Burning Books collection basket. <coughs> Every little thing counts, and what you put in here helps us make this happen again and again, so thank you. And I'll put it up. Leslie, why don't you pass around the, the sign-in sheet too? I'll pass around the sign-in sheet too. <laughs> All right. So my question is how we can build a discipline to left in this country, like for instance, my sister is an ROTC. She's doing, she'll run 17 miles in a weekend. The laugh, they're smoking weed, they're smoking cigarettes, they're drinking themselves to death, they're not using the gym. Like, but we got these ROTC credens that can do, you know, 500 or 1,000 sit-ups in a day. So how are we gonna build, how are we gonna get liberals that, that, that exercise them to that, that, kind of, that physical discipline, that mental discipline, that spiritual discipline. Because I'm seeing that discipline on the right, and I want to see that discipline on the left. I'm going to the gym from here, because everybody wants to know. <laughs> I'm smoking weed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both at the same time. <laughs> all right, all right. So, um, so, uh, <clears throat> So here's the thing. We do know that if the United States begins to see any threat to their, their power, um, that they will use military force to keep us in line. We saw this in the 1960s, we saw it in the 1970s. I mean, hell, in the 1980s in this country, the FBI illegally tapped 5,000 people's phones for signing a petition in support of El Salvador. Um, and, uh, and were willing at that time when the information began to come out that they had illegally tapped these phones, they began making plans to kill journalists who were going to report on it. I mean, that's the kind of government that we're dealing with. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that if we're going to win a revolution, uh, that we're going to have to do so militarily. Um, I think that we're... Um, we're certainly going to have to, um, to consider that possibility. And some of us are certainly going to have to make preparations towards it. So I just want to preface my answer with that. Um, how do we create discipline in our ranks? <coughs> Goddamn, you know, as an organizer, I don't know how many of you here have even tried to put together um, I've even tried to put together sign holding demonstrations. You're asking people sometimes to just sacrifice an hour, yeah. an hour of their life, right? Yes. Yeah. The idea that you're going to convince them to go out and you know get to the point where they can do a thousand push-ups in a day and haul themselves up and down ropes and um, carry extreme weights through difficult temperatures, I mean, it kind of boggles the mind, right? It's a difficult thing. Um, so I think on one level, those of us who are aware of this problem, we're going to have to begin talking about it. It's going to have to become a point that repeatedly gets brought up when we are talking about a path forward. But I think it also points to something else, that we have to find methodologies that are not military, that we have to find means of creating change that aren't always going to require the use of force. Um, I think as far as the use of force goes, we are so far behind the curve. Uh, at this point, I don't think great gains will be made through it, although I do believe that in some cases it will become a necessary component of the struggle. Those of us who recognize that it's going to become a necessary component might have some work to do. <laughs> I wish there was a magic answer for it. Um, the truth is, is sometimes I just don't know. Um, but uh, but hopefully we can get, make some ground there. It's so much easier just to dial a phone a thousand times a day. <laughs> well, dialing a phone a thousand times a day does offer one way forward, although there was something about the Shaq campaign that I haven't quite gotten to yet. One of the things about the campaign is, is that we began to recognize that there were these rules, right? Uh, these rules in place that companies had to... Uh, had to uh, participate in and to uh, obey, allegedly, uh, in order to, say, trade stock. So when we wanted to devalue Huntington Life Sciences' stock price, we said, well, how can we get them kicked off of certain boards? Okay, well, guess what? They need industrial insurance, right, to be carried by the New York Stock Exchange. 
So let's make sure they don't have industrial insurance. Um, if they want to be traded on, um, on other boards, they have to have a commercial banking account. Uh, guess what? Not a single commercial bank on earth will provide HLS with a checking account. They do all of their banking through the British government now. The United States government provides them with industrial insurance here, and the British government provides them with industrial insurance in England. <coughs> uh, what we began to see was when you try to do basically these rule breaks, when you try to um, force them you know, to comply with their own rules, well, the ruling class just changes the rules. An interesting thing about the word uh, authority, it comes from the same uh, root as the word author. It basically means who gets to name it, who gets to write it, who gets to say it. It ain't us. <laughs> so while those, uh, those things there about, um, about creating data blindness were handy at one point, the other thing is radicals, leftists, liberals, whomever, anarchists in this country, socialists, communists, we all need to become a hell of a lot more adaptive. We need to change our tactics frequently. Uh, and that was another threat of the Shack campaign. When something stopped working or when we started realizing that they were trying to find a way around it, we just stopped utilizing it. We went with another methodology altogether. Um, this requires a degree of creativity that I quite frankly don't have. I wasn't our best strategist uh, during, uh, during the movement. Although I came up with a couple doozies. I came up with a couple doozies. Real quick, real quick, I gotta brag. I gotta brag. <laughs> so, um, so you think about, you know, people talk about like the seat of power, you know, the, the seat of power for Bank of America is uh, where they were founded in North Carolina. They've got these offices there. And it's from there that all of the decision makers, the people who, who can actually make a change in the company, you know, they're all based out of there. It's where their CEO and COO are. And uh, I began thinking like, oh fuck, you know, all the decisions are coming from this building. And it's a skyscraper. We can't burn this thing down, you know. It's not like we're gonna just erase the building. So what can we do to make it to where it can't be inhabited, uh, at least for a short period of time? Anyone familiar with uh, personal body alarms or the devices that are used to purposely set off avalanches? <laughs> There's these uh, devices that, that emit very painful high frequency sound and they're meant to shake loose layers of, um, <laughs> of, uh, <laughs> of snow off of mountains. Uh, and. Uh, I saw one of those on a nature program one day, and I was like, oh my fucking god, oh my god. Um, I never ever got my, my hands on one, but I realized there was a scaled down consumer version of these technologies, and it was these personal alarms. And the idea with these alarms is there's a lanyard that goes around your wrist, you carry them in your hand, and there's a button on them, so if you get attacked, you press it, and it emits this very high decibel sound that'll travel for blocks and blocks. It'll travel up and down floors of buildings, right? And the thing is, is if somebody pulls the device from you, if they rip it away from you, that lanyard detaches, and then it can't be turned off unless you can get through the battery, which is only accessible from a port in the back. Of course, you know, you can stomp on the thing, right? You can break it, and that'll get rid of the sound. But what if it was epoxied to a window <laughs> and the lanyard was pulled. And so one of the things we saw during the course of the Shack campaign after I, you know, th thought about this out loud in front of enough people enough times, um, is we started seeing people doing these office walkthroughs where they dress very nice and professional and they'd go up in the elevators and then they'd be running through, you know, they'd get to the floor they wanted, they'd run through, they'd have bull, bull horns, they'd be, you know, rioting inside these buildings. And a couple people would just plunk a couple of these things on the windows and pull the cords. And what we found is, is once that quick setting epoxy dried to those windows, now they can't break it because they're going to smash a window out and it two floors up. And they can't get to the battery casing. And oftentimes it's not like they've got power drills just lying around. And so sometimes this would force evacuation of, uh, of buildings. There were other tactics that were used to do the same, some of which I 
I honestly think we're unethical. Um, the thing about these buildings is, you know, a little bit of high frequency sound, that's an annoyance. It's something that pushes people out of the building. They're going to have to temporarily get out of there. In one case, they weren't able to turn one of those personal alarms off for 12 hours. It ruined the entire workday for three floors of a company. Um, but uh, other tactics were used. Um, in Seattle, a building was, uh, was ink bombed, and whatever the chemical solution uh, that was used was, um, it made people sick. It sent people uh, to the hospital. And quite frankly, I've got to work for a living. I fucking hate doing it, but it's something that's necessary. And if at work, you know, somebody made me sick to make a political point, I think that's a movement I want to quickly be joining. Um, shortly after September 11th, and I don't doubt, I don't doubt that whoever did this was sincere and was trying to create change and was maybe coming from a place of frustration or, or whatever. Um, but two office buildings were simultaneously uh, smoke bombed. In, uh, in Seattle, and it forced the evacuation of, I mean, these were skyscrapers, these were, we're talking like 30 floors plus. Um, they were evacuated completely, and I'm certain that that caused a massive financial loss for the insurance company that was involved. But the thing was, is these people in these office yeah, towers, right. whoever, what the smoke was, where it was coming from, whether or not it was the result of a fire, uh, there was panic <coughs> inside of these office towers, and there were people who were disabled people in wheelchairs, that's something that matters very much to me as a person with a disabled sister. Some of them got trapped on stairwells. They didn't know what was happening. Um, that sort of use of what I, I would say we could legitimately call terror um, is not something I can personally bring myself to support. Um, more questions? Uh, any rogue administration could uh, claim legitimacy by saying they just received you know, 55 million votes in the last election. That's pretty hard to refute an argument like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're doomed to be their, their servants until we smartened up enough to vote for, you know, 55 million votes for a guy like N Ralph Nader or Kucinich or Sanders. Do um, you have any comments about why we're so dumb and why Iceland decided to put their bankers in prison? <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I don't good. know how many folks here are following um, what's happening in Iceland right now. If you're not following it, I would pay a lot of attention. American media doesn't like to, um, to talk about it very much because we've got uh, austerity happening here in the United States. They don't call it austerity, but that's of course what it is. Um, they call it the sequester or the fiscal cliff. And if any of you think Barack Obama is actually very concerned about it, you are fooling yourself. This gives him a chance to vilify his opponents while also making cuts to our basic services that you know he knows he wouldn't remain popular if he came out and said, we've got to make these cuts. Like the post so, office. So as we are heading towards this, don't believe that he wasn't absolutely delighted that it gave him a political out. Um, anyhow, the people in Iceland uh, a while back, um, when they started talking about cuts to basic social services over there, they said, wait a minute. We didn't create this bubble. We didn't benefit from it. While you folks are becoming millionaires and billionaires off of this and making these deals, where were those deals being made? Not in any kind of town square, not in any sort of public commons. We didn't participate in this. You know, these decisions were made without our consent and now we have to pay the consequences? Fuck that. So the ruling party got ran out of town. And they began, um, they began uh, basically through a process of, uh, of elections, which is something I have a lot less hope for here in the United States, because we have a much more powerful and much more violent ruling class. Um, but they began taking over at first local governments and eventually their federal government. And they issued uh, arrest warrants for um, a number of people in uh, the financial industry in Iceland, um, most of whom I believe actually fled and have so far uh, escaped actually doing time. Uh, but it's interesting. They've managed to, uh, to keep an economy that, um, that provides for most people's basic needs, um, and they've done it by running many of the rich people out of the country and saying, from here on out, 
we make these decisions. Um, I want to get to, uh, yeah. <laughs> Pretty good. That's a good thing. Um, <laughs> there's never been a third party here in the United States that has gained much in the way of traction. And, and I know that sometimes that gets attributed to an ignorance amongst the population. There's a degree of truth to, to, to allegations of ignorance, but I don't think that this is a willful or purposeful ignorance on the part of the population. I think that it's because we have a few people who own most major media outlets, and major media outlets basically provide the information which people use to make decisions. <laughs> if you have a few folks who own almost everything that gets heard, seen, or read, guess what power that gives them? They have the ability to, as Chomsky put it, uh, to basically um, create propaganda. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I would just like to point out that uh, even though we uh, voted against our fellow protester Ralph Nader in 2004, our other fellow protester Cindy Sheehan received twice as many votes as the Republican candidate in 2006. So, you know, right. And often it's the people who don't want any change of jumping right in front of you, like you said, with cameras and microphones and, right. you know, as loud as they can. <coughs> so. Well, I want to get into another reason, though, something that goes beyond public information and, and public willingness to, to vote for a specific party. I want to talk real quickly about corruption. Another thing that we've seen with third party politics here in the United States is that when they become powerful enough, they simply get bought out. People who are, um, who are good organizers for them or um, who have a lot of power and influence within that party, what happens is one of the more dominant parties, that, well, the dominant party, let's just say, um, they approach them money in hand, and one horrible thing about humans, we're very, um, temptation is a motherfucker. We are corruptible, and infinitely so. And so the thing is, is oftentimes, the good intentions of millions of people get focused on one figurehead, Cindy Sheehan, Ralph Nader. What happens when those people get corrupted? Suddenly this thing that we saw as a path forward um, becomes the same old, same old. She and so I like to again, not by Republican. She was she got twice as many votes as the Republican candidate. So it's nice to see your fellow protester go on and actually be in Congress. Right. You know, sure that could, corruption could happen, but it's nice to at least try right. voting against both parties instead of begging for more. Right. Just going somewhere with that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. What were you going to say, Josh? Um, what I was going to say was is that. Um, one thing you'll notice, uh, again, going back to Barack Obama, is he had this incredible grassroots organization in place um, when he was initially running for election, and he completely dismantled it once he got into office. Once he got into office, it was like, no, we don't want power to be dispersed out amongst as many people as possible. We want it to be held in the hands of just a couple select few. And so I, I personally would say that as we're moving forward, as we're talking about ways to get a more humane and just world, we need to worry about horizontalism. We need to worry about giving as many people as possible a voice rather than having one representative who we trust to do our will for us. Okay. It's not going to happen that way. We need to participate. We need to participate. It's us. It's our voice. It's our will. It's not Ralph Nader's will. It's us. <laughs> What, would, what hit me like a uh, block of bricks recently is I read this book that's called Our Ecological Footprint by William Rees. So basically the United States has got an ecological footprint of 5.5 planets. Germany, a, a, a purported social democracy, has got an ecological footprint of 2.5 planets. And Argentina, which is not that developed, has an ecological footprint of 1.1 planets. So basically anything over one planet is too much is using too many resources. So I guess my, my big question is, if purported social democracies aren't even sustainable, can can industrialism and capitalism be sustainable? No. 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 I want to say one other thing about Germany real quick, and again, this goes back to voting. 
and how we're always hopeful there's going to be that easy, that easy solution. In the 1970s, the anti-nuclear movement in Germany reached a real fever pitch. People were sabotaging train lines. Thousands of people would at times occupy these train lines to prevent nuclear waste from being shipped through or uranium from reaching um, nuclear power plants. This movement got so big that, of course, there were politicians who saw a chance to use their numbers to get themselves into power, and that party was, of course, the Green Party. And once the Green Party got into power, guess who it was who was ordering the police to remove protesters from the rails? The Green Party in Germany and the Social Democrats and many of the other parties that really got power from the grassroots in the 1970s, as soon as they had that power, they betrayed the people. And we see it continuing to happen over there to, to this day. There's something else I want people to think about when we talk about voting loan. I want to talk about the things that we're never allowed to vote on. Capitalism. You think we're going to hold a vote here in the United States? You think the Democrats or the Greens or the Pacific Party or the Tea Party or anyone else like that, they're going to let us have a vote on you know, whether or not there's one person in the United States who can make more than you know, uh, 100,000 people combined? No. We're never going to talk about that. We're never going to get to talk about a maximum wage or getting rid of nuclear power or dismantling the military or you know, declaring um, entire states off limits to paving or logging. These things we're never allowed to vote on. We don't get to talk about it. And um, I don't really think that getting in another party is going to be a solution to that. I'm sorry, folks. I'm starting to hurt here a little bit. I'm going to take three more questions. Um, why do you think we're going to win? Why do I think we're going to win? See, it's so weird because when you talk about these things, it sounds so incredibly naive. I mean, when you look at the power of this government, when you look at the amount of land that they've been able to control and the amount of force and will they've been able to exert across the globe, it sounds so weird to say, uh, you know, I think we're going to win because some of us, some of us are obstinate. I think we're going to win because some of us will fight on no matter what. I think we're going to win because some of us are so creative and intelligent that we're going to find means of, god damn, anyone following what's going on with hacktivism right now? It's an inspiration. It's a fucking inspiration, ain't it? And if those folks uh, keep refining, really begin uh, to become more politicized, because I'm going to say, you know, as much as I like marching along someone in a Guy Fox mask, um, <laughs> The politics of hacktivism have, by and large, I would say, they've been fairly shallow. Um, but I do think, I do think that we've got something that oftentimes um, those in power don't. They're fighting, they're fighting for things that are dead. They're fighting for money. They're fighting for houses. They're fighting for, for, for these things. We're fighting for life, sometimes our own. And I think that that gives us a motivation. I think that that gives us um, a will that might exceed their own, that I hope exceeds their own, uh, because if it doesn't, we're in some real trouble. And the back. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree with the whole thing about the political um, analysis, but what do you think about direct democracy? I think as long as we have representative, uh, quote, democracy, we have rule by the rich, mm -hmm. and um, it, it won't be, I mean, back in the 50s, Buckminster Fuller said, we now have the technology, and this was in the 50s, mm -hmm. to have a direct democracy. And, you know, it's been shown that the intelligence, the accumulative intelligence of a group is much higher than any individual in that group, you know, time and time again. Um, so, you know, I, I just like the idea of, and, and you wouldn't be able to corrupt, you know, <laughs> if you have direct democracy, everybody's voting on an issue, you know, you, you can't buy, you know, one side off. <coughs> you know, I, I like that idea. And in fact, there's a lot of ideas that I like. One interesting thing about growing up in the United States is while there are various cultures that are incorporated within the United States, by and large, we have a Hollywood culture, a Disney culture, something that from coast to coast is basically homogenous. 
We also have this massive federal government, people who live thousands of miles away from us, who've never been where we live, who think that they can make decisions for the rest of us. We have different bioregions in this country that have different needs, but we're not usually talking about different needs or different desires. So direct democracy, I think in some areas of the United States, could be, uh, um, could be useful. But I also think we need to break this country up. I think that it's too massive and too large. I think having one federal body that has this much power over these many people and this many resources is going to continuously be a recipe for disaster. Um, and so I think that there's not going to be one single solution to the revolutionary needs of different communities in the United States. I think that we will see some areas of the United States that, um, that basically um, go through a different process and that decide on a different method of community control than others. Um, so I want to warn against, I suppose, any solution um, that is presented as a homogenous cure-all for the entire country. Nate? Thank you. Uh, no, I just um, wanted to just mention that there's uh, uh, like there's there's a bunch of political prisoners uh, here locked up in New York State, and um, and if people uh, we're gonna continue to have uh, uh, letter writing nights here, and uh, and this I would like you, uh, I think political prisoner support is really important because you know then it, we know that people aren't forgotten and you get to bring messages in, and I would just like you to uh, just talk maybe a slightly of like what the importance of that is and how what ways uh, people can go about like why it's important for a movement to do that and why it's important for people to involve it and and, and what are the best ways to do that for as your from your experience. All right. Well, I'm gonna have to paint a little bit of a picture for you here, and um, it's a hard one for me to paint, but. So I get, uh, I get uh, taken into this uh, high medium federal prison and I show up and almost right away um, everything in this prison is divided up by first race and secondly gang affiliation. Um, and I show up and here I am and I'm a white guy and I'm not willing to play by the racial politics. I'm not going to pal around with fucking Nazi skinheads. Fuck a Nazi. Fuck a fucking Nazi, man. Um, there was no way I was going to do it. I had been a member of an organization in Eugene, Oregon when I, was, uh, when I was younger called Coalition for Human Dignity. And one of the things that we used to do was we had a little subgroup called Youth Against Racist Recruiting. And we would go to um, uh, venues that were putting on uh, Nazi skinhead bands, racist oi bands. And we would try to disrupt the show. We would try to prevent people from getting in. Um, we would try to use bullhorns and sirens to drown out the music. Uh, we would try everything we could to make these venues, um, uh, we would try to lessen their ability to recruit young people anyway into this racist ideology. The third day that I was in the detention center that they put you in before they ship you over to the main yard, a skinhead recognized me. He's like, man, I, I know I know you from somewhere. I know I know you from somewhere. And I knew where he knew me from because I punched him in the face one time for wearing a jacket that said six million is not enough. <clears throat> and so the first time I went to get my hair cut, um, the way that he had decided he was going to exact revenge on me was he began spreading a rumor that um, I was a Jew and that's why I had uh, assaulted him so I sat down in this chair, and you're only allowed to get your hair cut um, by members of the same race. And um, I sat down, and this guy goes, I don't cut you hair. And um, smart fellers, too. <laughs> smart fellers across the board. <laughs> so here I am, and this is a very dangerous situation, though, because in a place that is ruled by gangs and where your protection comes from your affiliations, I suddenly had no affiliation. Beyond this, Sheridan is in a small town in Oregon that used to be supported largely by logging and ranching. And I'm an environmentalist, eco-terrorist nonetheless, and a vegan. And, um, and that meant to me uh, that the staff members who are almost exclusively from the surrounding small towns that used to rely on timber and cattle grazing 
um, in which environmentalists had managed to put restrictions in place to stop, it meant that the staff, by and large, did not uh, care for me. The other thing going on was that the outside world, by and large, did not know I was there because the media did not give a lot of coverage to our case. And if they did know about me, they had heard about me as a terrorist, somebody who um, most sometimes when you hear terrorism, you think about somebody who is assaulting the public. Believe it or not, this is all heading towards prison support. So there I am, and I've got no support. I rarely get to see my friends. I rarely get to see my family. The prison administration is doing everything they can to keep visitors off of my list. Um, I was only there for a short while when an officer named C.O. Miller, <coughs> it's the first time I've said his name publicly, began to give me these very long and humiliating pat-downs that eventually devolved into outright sexual assault. And this continued for months and months of my life as I was held in, you know, horrible conditions. I eventually got sent to the hole for um, participating in an interview with a, a, a zine that a kid did about skateboarding and dumpster diving called Trasher. He sent me these <laughs> interview questions. I mean, this is a, a magazine with a circulation of like 25 copies per issue. And for conducting an interview without the warden's permission, I got sent into um, what was supposed to be solitary confinement, the special housing unit. But then um, the compound got raided by the FBI and they weren't there to arrest inmates. They were there to arrest guards for exchanging sex with inmates um, for heroin, uh, weed, and tobacco. And so all of a sudden they've got to make a, a big display because all these you know, staff members have been arrested. They've got to say, well, the problem goes into the, the general population of the prison, right? And so they go in and they, they accuse tons of people, hundreds of people in the yard of having somehow participated in this conspiracy to get heroin and stuff in. So all of a sudden, I am in a 9 foot by 12 foot cell with two other men 24 hours a day. I can't fucking tell you what it does to you. The one thing, the one thing that made my life bearable the one thing that got me through my day and that I had to look forward to six days a week was mail call. It was everyday folks on the outside who wrote to me, who told me about what their day was like, who chatted with me a little bit about politics, who wanted to discuss things going on in the news. It was those, skating, those skateboarder kids who wrote me about my love of skating. It was hardcore kids who wanted to talk about obscure records. It was this that got me through. If we're going to be revolutionaries, and I know the word sounds trite, but I know a couple of you here are. A couple of you are revolutionaries. Some of us are going to go to prison. Some of us are going to do time. We're going to have some of our most basic needs taken away from us, and we're going to be treated in a manner that is horrific. And that means that those of us on the outside, those that care, we have to show that we care. And we do that by writing by putting commissary uh, money on people's books so that they can buy things, so that they can have a little bit of relief from that deprivation. And we do it by sending in books, keeping people informed, and making sure that when they get out, they still have a place in the movement. I hope that answers your question. down tonight and because I've had this respiratory infection I haven't rehearsed this speech a whole lot so I'm sure there's parts where uh, I could have been a little bit stronger I'm gonna stick around to chat or ask any more questions on a more personal level I'll be here thank you all again for coming thank you